Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, so why my video is not coming on? Uh, is is my video on? Uh, students, uh, is the video on? It's, to me, it doesn't show that it's on. No, Austin. No? Okay. Let's check why. I think now it's come. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's spend this time with a word of prayer. So any one of us can please lead in prayer. Let's go ahead. Anybody can lead in prayer. Shall I? Yes, please. Hallelujah. So true. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your uh, grace, your mercies by which, Lord, you have brought us this far, Lord. Once again, you've given us this uh, opportunity, Lord, to come together as a class, uh, not to listen to this uh, lecture. Father, Lord, we pray uh, that whatever we hear, we listen. These are deep truths, Father, Lord. Have, may we be able to put them into practice upon we pray for the lord that uh, not many get the opportunity to learn these but you have given this opportunity father let it not let us not take them for granted lord help us lord have this um, constant pursuing father of uh, these truths that we are learning uh, Father Lord, and uh, all the purposes, Father, that you have for us, Lord, uh, and that we be able to use these strategies, use these um, different ways in which, Father, the people in uh, in, in the word of God, um, Father, laid out, uh, Father, foundations of their plans, the purposes, Lord, that you had for them. We thank you. We praise you for Pastor Paul. Uh, bless him, Lord. Mm. Anoint uh, him, uh, Father, with uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, give us a receptive heart, a sensitive spirit. Uh, Lord, give us willingness to obey you and trust you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. All right. So last week, uh, we completed Chapter 5, Competitive Advantage and Strategies. So we did some of the points that we looked at, one, um, know what you're up against. When you compete, compete clean and fair. Uh, develop a winning strategy. Uh, so when you're strategizing, planning, develop a strategy that is winning, right? Sometimes, you know, we all go through fear. We all go through, uh, you know, change, which is not always nice. But, uh, you know, we looked at the point, Goliath is not your real enemy, fear was. And, and how David, you know, just uh, was able to, overcome that fear because he just knew uh, who he was up against and the strategies that he used was brilliant. Uh, get the Lord's counsel uh, and be open to unusual strategies. And we look at many other aspects there. So let's get into chapter six, organizational structure and design, right? Now, organizational structure and design is important for any organization whether it is a organization with just five people whether it's an organization with uh, you know maybe a hundred people it doesn't really matter you need organizational structure and design right and what does it do when we have structure and design it enables us to adapt to the seasons and situations that are happening around us 
right? Uh, it it avoids bottlenecks. It it's a process where uh, it makes the environment that we're working in easier, right? Now, getting the right structure and right design is important, but you also need the right people to fill up those positions. Right? So, for example, there's an organization, uh, you need the right people, right? Right people to uh, fill up that positions. And only then you, you know, you know that as an organization, you will be able to, you know, win and and do well as an organization. So let's look at a few points uh, in your notes. Structure, order, and design are godly virtues, right? First uh, Corinthians 14, 33 and 40. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, that all things be done decently and in order. Now, we've heard this many times. God is a God of structure. God is a God of structure, order, and design. When you look at the universe itself and uh, how the universe functions, the creation itself is has order, structure, and design, right? Nothing came out uh, from, you know, everything didn't come out of nothing, right? Uh, it was structure, order, created by God. And God instituted the church, God instituted marriage and family, and both these institutions are made with certain order. They have a certain structure, right? Now, why is structure and design important? Because structure and design will portray um, wisdom, right? So, if you look at, you know, if you look at creation, look at the sun, the moon, the stars, and the galaxies, and how everything is, you know, just so orderly set in place in the universe. You look at it and we think, hey, what wisdom, you know, God has. You look at the plants and creation, the animals, look at the wisdom in which they, uh, they, you know, they, cre they are created, they, the way they function, the way they procreate, everything. It's so much of wisdom. Structure and order and design will help an organization to walk and to work in wisdom, right? And all through the scriptures, all the Old Testament, even the New Testament, we see that God works with order, structure, and design. And when we as an organization or a ministry, uh, we may set up a ministry, right? We're just starting off now. Uh, align your organizational structure to a strategy. Right. Now, well, let me just give you the structure that we have at ABC. So we have a senior pastor, then we have associate pastors, then we have ministry leaders, and then we have team leaders, and then volunteers. Right. Uh, this is just a basic structure. Right. Uh, that's how the organization uh, you know, has a structure. Look at what God does uh, in the book of Numbers when the people of Israel are coming out of Egypt. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 52. The rest of all the Israelites shall set up camp company by company, each man with his own group and under his own banner. Now look at this. Very interesting, right? God is telling the people of Israel, he's brought them out of Egypt, He's not saying, okay, just keep walking, take left, take right, uh, walk however you want, do what you want, uh, as long as we just reach the promised land. That's the promise I gave you. You'll reach the promised land. So you need to reach. I will take you there. No. God is saying, okay, the way you go out also, the way you enter into the promised land, there needs to be order, there needs to be design. What does he say? Right, Numbers 10, verse 13 and 14. They began to march at the command of the Lord through Moses, and each time they moved, they moved in the same order. Those under the banner of the division, led by the tribe of Judah, started out first. Company by company, with Nasun, son of uh, Aminadab, Dab in command. Now, there are 600 Israelites, or 600,000 people who are there in the wilderness, 
and God has given instructions to Moses. Moses, here's what you're going to do. One, first thing, you're going to take these people, set them up into tribes. Now, we know there are 12 tribes. So each tribe, you have a banner, you have a flag. So you will walk with your tribe. Now, the tribe of Judah can't say, hey, I want my friends are in the tribe of Benjamin. I want to go and join there. No. Tribe of Judah, you be there, right? Now, each tribe had a leader. So 12 tribes, they come and report to Moses directly. So Moses is there. Um, just an example. Moses is there. The tribe leaders come in my tribe. This is what happening in my tribe. And you know, you see, uh, they come and give reports to Moses, right? But here's the thing: the Lord God also established a way in which you know they would walk, and then they would camp for certain days in a certain place. So it was not like they can camp however they wanted. No, uh, uh, God also gave them directions on okay, tribe of Benjamin, you're here. Tribe of Judah, tribe of uh, Manasseh, uh, these are the places that you will, um, you know, uh, settle it. Tribe by tribe, when they moved, they moved in order. And uh, there were different kinds of trumpets. This is very interesting, right? Different kinds of trumpets for different kinds of uh, situations. So they, uh, one kind of trumpet was to gather the leaders another trumpet was to gather the entire community another was uh, a, a trumpet that would say okay uh, the camp has to begin to prepare to move right so everything was in order right can you picture there's 600,000 people imagine you say okay go and tell them it's time to move one person going and telling the tribe and then that tribe leader will forget what to say and then everyone are just doing their work no that's all. There was a trumpet, you blow it, everyone heard it. Hey, this trumpet means it's time to move. So probably they had you know the entire day to pack their things, everything, and begin their journey. So in a very organized way, they God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. And even as they entered the promised land, they were very, very organized. Now, was it the people who were organized? Yes, but God had given the instruction to Moses and Moses, along with his team, was able to uh, perform the, the structure and the strategies. So what about us? What about us in ministry? What about us in the workplace? Align your organizational structure to strategy. And so uh, you have a strategy in place. God, uh, I want to reach out to this entire a city in the next five years i want to see a, a a ministry that is blessing lives touching lives and the church i want to start a bible college now align or uh, align organizational structure so if you if you if you have just a vision in the at least in the future you should think about okay you need somebody who can handle the bible college you need a team that can you know call and uh, encourage people you need a uh, you know graphics team to do the so you're having all the picture in your mind. Now you may be 10, 20 people in the church, but if that's the vision, that's the entire vision that you have, you need a strategy. Otherwise it's going to be, you know, remember what uh, the book of James says, faith without deeds is our guess. So we have the faith, we have the vision, you have to put it into practice. Of course, at the right time, we'll have the right teams, right people coming into place. Right now, we must be wise in this also, right? If you're, you know, if you have a hundred people in your church, you don't need uh, twenty-five people as staff in the church, right? or you have a hundred people working in your office. You don't need, you know, or, sorry, you, you know, you're starting a small-scale company. You don't need at one time hundred people. So you plan out, you strategize, you see what I need, at when we need, you know, how do we get them? How do we get the right people? Um, things uh, as a as a visionary as a pioneer uh, that these are some things that we must think of right uh, even the way that you know worship was ordained in the old testament in the old covenant was so organized 
right? Uh, there was a there was an entrance to the tabernacle. There was a back entrance. Uh, it was it was very meticulous right? because God by nature is that way. He's very organized, right? Next point: organizational design affects strategic capability and sustainability. Right? Uh, affects strategic capability and sustainability. Whenever we start something, we want it to sustain. We want it to last long. Right? We want it to make an impact for many years and for many generations. Right? Let's look at this verse uh, from First Chronicles chapter sixteen, was. 4 and 37, right? Then David assigned some of the Levites to the chest of God to lead worship, to intercede, give thanks, and praise God of the God of Israel. David left Asaph and his co-workers with the chest of, of the covenant of God and in charge of the in charge of the work of worship. They were responsible for the needs of worship around the clock. Now the first thing David did when he became the king was he brought the Ark of the Covenant into which the Ark of the Covenant was basically um, a symbol of God's presence. Right? When, uh, if you backtrack and go to the time of Moses and Joshua, they carried the Ark of the Covenant wherever they went. Right? It was to say that the, it, the, the presence of God, right? And this Ark of the Covenant was placed in a tent covering in Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that David desired was to have non-stop worship in that place. So he didn't say, uh, David didn't say, okay, you uh, you know, you form the teams, you do it this way. He organized for it. He himself planned, right? Of course, God gave him the wisdom. Here's what he did. He organized 4,000 people to attend to the tabernacle. 4,000 people. And I think, uh, David, there are people trying to attack you, and there are people who are uh, enemies are always trying to track you down and maybe to destroy the Israelite army. You want to use. Yes, 4,000 musicians round the clock. Round the clock from more people who are singing. People who were singing in the night and they would take turns. Right now, these were again organized into teams. Can everyone? Okay, um, I think the network was slow. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just check. All right. Uh, sorry about that. I guess I'm a little away from the internet Wi Fi. So. All right, so all the musicians and singers were highly skilled, so there was excellence in all that was done isn't that wonderful david didn't say david didn't say okay we're going to do round the clock worship 
4,000 people, whoever can join, join and sing. No. I, uh, they were all musicians and singers who were highly skilled. Right? And everything was done in excellence. The worship of the Tabernacle of David went round the clock 24-7 for 33 years, which is never done before. How did he do that? He organized. There was sustainability. It didn't happen for one year. It didn't happen for five years. 33 years. Why? Because the teams were set in place. Now, of course, David had the resources of 4,000 people. As we uh, in our organization, the work that we are doing, we may not have the resources initially, but as we get the resources, uh, as as resources have been given to us, and God gives us opportunity, make sure that we, uh, you know, have effective strategy in place so that there's sustainability uh, and that is, you know, whatever is done is done for a long time. David did that. Next thing, have the right. Yes, go ahead, Debbie. Yeah, I just wanted to share something uh, that's happening over here uh, in the past few one week. Uh, th this very much uh, was reminded of that when we were telling about David's continual worship. Uh, so there is uh, a university called Asbury in Kentucky. Uh, so they had a chapel, regular chapel service. Uh, that started on Wednesday, February 8th, 10 o'clock, which has never stopped. Uh, so as you were teaching this uh, organizational strategy, I was just thinking, like, when it is a move of God like this in a wide scale, right? Uh, 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 one thing is you are requesting prayers, right, for the that will last, because uh, we like there are reports like it is being happening now in another university in ohio so it's like slowly you know coming up uh so but it, uh, it of course there should be like a protection over it uh, rather than a uh, lot of skepticism on it so yeah uh it's uh, a lot of repentance and confession and uh, there's a genuine move of god that's what everyone is reporting and saying uh it's wonderful to see that and i was just reminded of uh, like how in whoa, 33 years how did that happen uh like yeah. uh, that time yeah that's amazing yeah just wanted to amazing. yeah ask for prayer support as well yeah Sure, Vivian. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, uh, yes, very uh, university where there is this revival. But here's the thing: David's was pre-planned, right? He planned it and he did it. Now, what happens in times like this, right? We just it was just a regular chapel service. It started off it just a move of God. Now, a good thing to do is let that worship continue. That you know, just being there. Uh, but of course, we need team, right? So in the back end, uh, something that you know, the planning, the organizing can be done, right? Now, uh, that's also important, right? So imagine the worship is going on. Now it's not like the same person who's leading worship. There had to be that, you know, that switch of musicians and singers. So uh, what's important is in, in the background, some kind of strategy, some kind of planning. Uh, I'm sure it will be done, will be, you know, going on. Uh, and there are people who are there for, you know, day and night. Uh, and it's just going on. So, you know, uh, practical things, right? Like uh, just providing for some kind of water or something, right? Uh, so, uh, so there are two kinds, but it's wonderful when God does it, right? Both ways, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's wonderful to do it. And, you know, the reason David was able to, you know, have this for 33 years, I, I think it's because of his meticulous planning, right? Uh, 4,000 people, 288 prophetic singers and musicians, 24 smaller units, team leaders, everything was set in place, right? So there was never a time when, hey, who's going to go lead worship next? Everyone knew their part. Everyone knew that they should be there, right? Next point. 
Yes. Just a small follow up on what you were telling. Like, yeah, there are people who are, uh, you know, 24 by 7 volunteering, supporting Wonderful. this, like, especially the faculties. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, like they were saying, like, uh, small, uh, these families have small kids and all, but still they are like uh, so passionate that they're staying over and they are volunteering and, you know, providing the support that is required. And it, it is wonderful to see like even the professors and everyone is uh, like they have halted the classes uh, for this. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so that's uh, you know there are you know we studied a little bit of this on revivals, visitations, moves of God. When there's a move of God, there is a genuine, genuine work of God. There is people's hearts. If all of these titles and all these uh, achievements will all be you know put down because there's a move of God. Uh, there'll be a sense of unity, sense of oneness, humility. Uh, you know, a sense of uh, holiness, all of these things will begin to, uh, you know, just show you know, where there is a move of God. So it's wonderful. Right. Uh, next point. Uh, feel free to stop me in between. You can ask questions right anytime in between. The next point have the right teams in place. Now, Teams are important. We know about this. We've seen it in the Old Testament. We've seen Jesus himself uh, having the right teams. Uh, but the right teams are very important. Right? Let's look at this. First Chronicles uh, 12, that, that 17, 18, 21, and 22. When David went out to meet them, this is what he said. If you have come in peace and to help me, you are most welcome to join this company. But if you have come, to betray me to my uh, to my enemies, innocent as I am, the God of our ancestors will see through you and bring judgment on you. God's Spirit took control of one of them, Amasai, who later became the commander of the 30. And he called out, David, son of Jesse, we are yours. Success to you and to those who helped you. God is on your side. David welcomed them and made them officers in his army. They served David as officers over his troops because they were all outstanding soldiers. Later, they were officers in the Israelite army. Almost every day, new men joined David's forces so that his army was soon enormous. David was one of the most, uh, uh, was the most successful king, right? Uh, politically, administratively, militarily, and spiritually, he was. He thrived as a king, right? Uh, why? Because David was able to set in place right teams. He was able to build people up, right? And organize strong units. Uh, he was able to do that, right? He built an army. Now, before he became the king of Judah, even before he became the king, there were about thousands of, uh, sorry, not thousands, maybe hundreds. I think it was 800 or people. Hundreds of people were already saying, okay, David, we'll follow you. David is saying, why are you following me? People are behind my life. No, no, we'll follow you. Whatever you say, we'll do. So but even before he became the king, he had an army with him. And now when he became the king, he had all the liberty. You know, Saul is dead and gone. He's become the king. He had all the liberty. So he used those strengths and he established strong teams. Right, strong teams. David had a special set of 37 warriors who oversaw the entire army. Out of these were the famous 30 and the three who were the most valiant of David's soldiers. All of this is in 2 Samuel 23. So he had a team. He had a core team that he worked with. Right? 30 people were his main team. And out of the 30 people, the famous three were his core team. You see how he organized this whole thing? Who is David? Shepherd boy. I'm sure I, I'm just picturing him looking after the sheep and saying, okay, five go there, five go here, 10 go here. So when these five try to run away, I'll use these five other sheep to. Maybe he was thinking of all of these things. But you see, he was he he had it in him. 
it is always there and, and then the wisdom of god enabled him to have the right teams in place when you and i are working in an organization uh well, you know have the right teams in place now you may not be in a position to hire the right people uh, but even with the teams that you have empower them build them up you know work together grow together become a strong unit right uh, and in ministry if if it's you know if it's something that you're planning to build a team think ahead you know when you know, plan ahead have a nice team a strong team now building these teams takes time right it doesn't happen overnight uh, but when you have the vision when you have a strategy those teams will be built very strong teams right sometimes your best team begins with the most unlikely let's look at this uh, was from first samuel 22 1 and 2 right david fled from the city of gath and went into a cave near the town of adula when his brothers and the rest of the family heard that he was there they joined him people who op were oppressed or in debt or dissatisfied went to him about 400 men in all and he became the leader their leader now this was the this is what I was talking about the, during the lowest point of his life he was running away for his life uh, you know hiding in caves destined to be the next king but he was a fugitive running at this time 400 men decide to join and come under David's leadership because they knew David's capabilities and here's what David did David welcomed them come this is where David's mighty army began, an unlikely moment in his life, in an unlikely place, starting with unlikely men. Isn't so wonderful, right? Look at this. David is running for his life. He's hiding in caves. Right? Saul is still you know, trying to kill him. He's in the lowest point of his life. Right? He's saying, hey, what kind of life is this? I'm hiding in caves and... Uh, the king is after me. God, you said I'm going to become king of Israel. What is happening? God is saying, God made it in such a way that, okay, David, you're on the lowest point of your life. I will send some people, 400 people come and say, okay, David, we know about you. We've heard that you killed Goliath. We know that you, you know, spared Saul's life. We know that you are going to be, you're anointed and God has used you. Uh, in, when you were in Saul's army. So we are coming under your leadership. David says, okay, come. And he begins his, you know, strengthening this army. Unlikely place. Who knew that 400 people will come to a cave searching for David? In an unlikely time. They didn't say, oh, you're running away from Saul. Saul is going to catch you and kill you. Then there's no use of being around you. So let me choose somebody else. No. These are unlikely men. Whether you're building a team or whether you're building an organization, you may not always have the opportunity to start of your start being perfect. Right? Uh, it's good if it's perfect, but even if it's something very small, it's all right. right? Uh, uh, if, even if it's unlikely people, it's all right. Uh, I reminded of you know uh, in in Mangalore there was this we were about 10 12 people and uh, this young couple came to church right uh, and they came they sat and they went away the next Sunday again they came and I, I began to talk to them and they were saying you know what we don't know much about the Lord or all we know you know we are from a different background. Uh, we don't know much about the Lord, and, uh, but we like the word here. So is it okay if we come? I said, yeah, sure, we can come. Uh, and we spent a lot of time together. And eventually, you know, this young couple were, uh, you know, always there for all our meetings, all our programs. And then the, another young couple came. And so they said, you know, we, we'd like to be part of a volunteering team. And it was so wonderful right, to see that when people themselves come and say, okay, I'm willing, I'm there for you. Two things. One, 
very important is remember that God has sent them to you. God has entrusted them to you. Two, it is your responsibility to look after them, to care for them, to build them up in the ways of God. Uh, it is our responsibility. It's not like they've come, okay, we they're volunteering, so that's good. Let them volunteer. No, we, we must make the effort of being there, of empowering them, of training them, leading them. And that's what David did. Um, when these 400 people came, he, he was able to build them into a strong unit as, as, as an army. Believe in your team. See beyond your current struggles. Right? Now, uh, we'll not read this entire verse in Mark 16, but here's what happened. Let, let me just uh, uh, summarize it for you. Uh, the Lord Jesus is, oh, you know, he's dead. He rose again from the dead. He's come back. He meets his disciples, right? Now, the 11 who was closest to Jesus did not believe that Jesus was uh, resurrected from the dead. You know, they, saw, they saw Jesus crucified. They saw him buried in the tomb. And now they thought it's all over, right? I can imagine they were, you know, in this place of uh, mixed emotion because they spent the most time with Jesus. They were in a place of bereavement. What kind of a death has Jesus gone through? And that, you know, gruesome death. And they buried him. But now Jesus is resurrected from the dead and he's come to meet them, right? These were, they were unbelieving. They didn't think that Jesus will rise again, raise again from the dead. Even though they were there when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he raised from the dead. What did Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. But here now they didn't believe. They have looked at the natural. They're saying, okay, no, Jesus is dead. They crucified him. In their minds, he was dead and gone. They did not believe the initial reports of uh, what Mary had, Mary Magdalene had brought. That the, tomb, the stone was rolled away and the body was not there. But these were the closest men of Jesus, whom Jesus personally trained. This is his core team, not the 72, his core team. But what is quite amazing we see here is that the same 11 who, Je who did not believe Jesus resurrected from the dead, he corrected them for their unbelief and he commissioned them, go and make disciples. He gave them the great commission. He gave them the great vision. Jesus didn't flinch. He didn't say, oh, I trained you for three and a half years. After three and a half years, is this how this is? You still didn't believe me? No, he knew that it was just for a moment. All they needed was to get over this moment. Once they got past that moment, they were equipped, empowered to the point that they were willing to give their lives for this vision and the mission uh, that he was placing before them. Here's the thing. He could trust them. Jesus could count on them. You and I can learn so many things from this. Believe in your team. Believe in the people that you have invested in. Uh, don't quit on them, right? You know, the, you know, I can talk of many, many places where I have, you know, made mistakes. But I thank God for the team that I work with you know, because those mistakes, there are some mistakes, there are mistakes that we make and we you know, work, but we are here to build each other up. Believe in your team. See beyond their struggles, right? Uh, when you believe in them, they are encouraged and they're willing to grow, right? So just because somebody makes a mistake in your team, uh, for example, in the ministry, somebody makes a mistake, doesn't mean we can say, okay, you made this mistake, so now you you know, we'll choose somebody else. No, even your team. Jesus didn't choose another 12, different 12 people. He chose the same 11 people. This is the people who, like, for example, Peter denied him. And he says, Peter, you lead the church. What, what, what belief, what trust he had on Peter. And that is something that we must develop as leaders. We must develop this. Uh, ability to see beyond people's failures. Right? Uh, it's very easy for those failures to come into our mind first. Hey, did, he did this, this, this wrong. 
But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't look at the failure of the disciples, but he said, as of now, you're going through a season, but I know what you can do. I'm commissioning you. I'm empowering you to go and make disciples out of nations. And they did it. They were willing to give their life for Christ. Right? When we believe in our team, they'd be willing to do anything beyond a 40-hour week worker. They'll be able to do more than that. They'll go above and beyond. They'll go walk that extra mile with you because they believe in you. Right? Next point. With just the right people, you can overcome the odds. Now, this is a wonderful story. Judges chapter 7 and verse 7. God said to Gideon, I'll use the 300 men who lapped at the stream to save you and give you the Midianite, give you, give Midian into your hands. All the rest may go home. Now, when you have time, just go ahead and read Judges 7. Now, what happens is Gideon is ready to go against God has commissioned Gideon. Gideon, I'm going to use you to lead the people and defeat the Midianite army. Now, the Midianite army was a vast army, a strong army, right? Now Gideon says, are you sure, God? Yes. Okay. You call all of, all of them who are willing to fight. So 32,000 men came up. Came up. And in these 32,000 men, 22,000 were fearful and afraid. So God said to Gideon, send those 22,000 home. So you have 10,000 left. In these 10,000, God picked 300. Now, how did he pick these 300? He said... To them in these 10,000 men tell them to go to the river and drink water right so whoever drank water by taking the water in their palms and drinking it there were 300 people the others you know they had a posture of just you know drinking directly from the river those who drank directly from the river were sent home those who drank from the you know, to, with their hands making a cup shape. Uh, it was a symbol of readiness for battle, right? Alertness and readiness, right? So Gideon took those 300 and went into battle. God stepped in and with these 300 people, the Midianite army was defeated and there was peace in the land of Israel for 40 years. Can you picture that? I can picture Gideon standing there, 32,000. Okay, 10,000 gone. Uh, sorry, 22,000 gone. I'm left with only 10,000 people. And then God says, no, that's not enough. You do this. And there were 300 left. And I can picture Gideon saying, 300 people gone. This is why vast Midianite army. God says, don't worry, I'm going with you. I will go. I will go before you, and with these 300 people, you will defeat the Midianite army. They did it, right? And there was peace in the land for 40 years. Sometimes we don't need a large army to outdo competition or to do great things. We, we don't need a large army. We just need the right people with the right attitude to help you fulfill that vision. It's not always the quantity. Sometimes... Uh, it is the quality, the right people in the right place, right? So in terms of your business, in terms of ministry, uh, whatever you are, if there are, if you're planning to do uh, uh, something big in ministry, uh, even if you have two or three people to begin with, do not despise it. Right? The Bible says, do not despise meager beginnings. God can do with those two or three people what you could have, what more than what you can do with a hundred people. Ninety of them can come, sit on the table, work, and do be unproductive. But God can say, use maybe ten people and say, these ten are more than enough for you to fulfill the vision that I've given you. That's a wonderful, you know, wonderful, wonderful way, uh, and that God can work. And right? so. We need the wisdom of God to understand the way he works. Right? Uh, never look at it as, oh, it can't be done. Uh, each one of us are designed uh, for maximize function and performance. Right? Now, 
uh, let, let's go to the next one. Break it down only to the necessary levels. Stay lean and stay flat. Now, in this portion, we see that Moses had a challenge, right? He had to disseminate God's commands down to each individual. So you got about 600,000 people. Imagine Moses saying, and out of the 600,000, maybe about 500,000 had problems. You know, he's saying this, she's saying this. Uh, he's saying we'll not go. She's saying we'll not go. All kinds of problems. And Moses is there thinking, I'm hearing directly from God. And now these people are all coming one by one. It is too much for me. He was stressed out. Right? He had to ensure disputes had to be challenged. He had to ensure this peace. He had to ensure that God's standards were set in place. Uh, he had to ensure that there was prayer. Uh, everything. Uh, it was too much for him. So what did he do? Moses raised up leaders. He delegated leaders uh, on important matters. Right. So in terms of peace within the teams, within the uh, the a camp, uh, he delegated leaders and he said, OK, these leaders will report to me directly. Brilliant move. Here's what he did. He had a judiciary process in place. So leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens, thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens, all leaders. Then he had 12 captains, one over each tribe. Then he had governance, 70 elders appointed to govern and address daily needs. Oh, I didn't get enough mana morning, I slept, overslept, so I couldn't go pick up mana. Okay, no problem. We'll go and ask the other, you know, the governance team, will, you go to the 70 elders. Okay, I didn't pick up enough mana. Okay, they'll give you some. Go to this house, take it from them. So then that task is resolved. It doesn't have to go to Moses for that. Moses is busy talking to God in the mountains. Right. So he made sure that everything is delegated. Special task force, 12 captains, one from each tribe to go and spy to the, in the land of Canaan. Then he had priests and of worship and service in the tabernacle. So if he wanted to know something, he just asked the high priest, okay, is everything okay? If he wanted to know uh, about uh, you know things that are happening within the camp, could probably go to the uh, th uh, the leaders and ask them, or the twelve tribes of each uh, tribe. He could ask them what's happening in your tribes. Right? Then he had Levites, priests who uh, assisted the service in the tabernacle. Right? So you see this; it's a wonderful. There was strategy in everything that God did. Right? And you and I, uh, you know, we may be working in an organization right now. Or you may have a plan to, or you may be already entrepreneurs, started your own business, or you have a plan You're already in ministry, leading pioneering in ministry, or you plan to pioneer a ministry. Gather these inputs. Right? If you're leading a ministry in the church, gather these inputs, use them, uh, and use effective strategy. Uh, because God is a God of order and design, and everything that He did was done in an order, done in design. We saw the examples from David's life as a king, he did it in order, Moses did it in order. So, we are called to do things in order, not only in our professional life or ministry, but also in our personal life, because that's what God expects of us, right? So, we'll close here. Uh, any questions, any thoughts? questions all right no worries let's cl quickly close in prayer father we thank you for this time we thank you for your word and and lord we've learned so much today lord that you have you're a god who's a god of order and design and structure and we pray god in every area of our lives whether it's in the workplace whether in ministry or in the family in our personal lives god help us lord to be more organized uh, to continue to depend on you for wisdom, to do the things that you have called us to do, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will empower us, not only through our skills, but also empower us in our spirit, uh, anoint the things that we do, the plans that we have, oh God, and let it be pleasing in your sight. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us. Thank you, Lord, for trusting us, Lord. And we pray, God, that we will continue to 
do everything that you have called us to do for the for the establishment and betterment of your kingdom here on earth. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you on Monday uh, for our next class. God bless. God bless. Thank